Welcome back to our final Lenten message, Surprise the World, based on the book of that title by Michael Frost. Frost encourages us to surprise the world by developing five missional habits that allow us to engage others in the faith. The five habits have the acronym BELLS, Bless, Eat, Listen, Learn, and then Today, Sent. We are to see ourselves as sent by God, to alert others to the reign of God in Jesus Christ, to see ourselves as sent on a mission. Now, I don't uh, see a whole lot of movies normally. If uh, this lasted until the, uh, well, till kingdom come, I probably wouldn't see all the movies that I have missed in the last 10 years. But the uh, restrictions have allowed me to at least see a few movies, and one that I saw with Tammy this week was uh, the last installment of the Mission Impossible series, uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. And as always in those movies, there's a point in time when the message comes, and it says, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is. And you know, that, that same could apply to Christians as well. Our mission, should we choose to accept it, is, well, what is it? What is that mission? Well, let's look at the, what the Bible says about it. Today is Palm Sunday. It's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem to great fanfare and much rejoicing, the day that started the last week before his crucifixion. Next Sunday is Easter. But before that is Good Friday and his death and resurrection. Now, all the Gospels record the triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday, but they each give a little different angle Tell us some different things. I'm going to read today from Luke's gospel. And here's how he describes it. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Now, you, you might notice here that there's not a mention of the palm branches. It's John that describes it as palm branches. And Matthew and Mark, they say that people spread their cloaks and branches on the ground. So we call it Palm Sunday, although we could call it Coat Sunday. Either way, they're celebrating Jesus with palms and branches and coats as he comes into town. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So what's going on here? Well, the people are, are celebrating, and they are shouting, and they're actually shouting Scripture. They're shouting Psalm 118. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And in some of the other Gospels, they're also shouting, Hosanna, or save us, or Savior. Psalm 118. Now, why are they doing this? Why this psalm? Why Psalm 118? Well, it's a great psalm, and I would encourage you to read it sometime this week. But they're shouting it because it proclaims that the long-awaited reign of God has come in Jesus Christ. 
that God's kingdom is coming on earth as it is in heaven. And the Pharisees can't stand it. It's a message they can't stand. They tell Jesus, teacher, tell your disciples to shut up. Jesus replies, well, it won't do any good. Even if these were quiet, the stones themselves would proclaim this news. And that's good news for us. The good news is for us that that nothing can stop the world from seeing God's reign in Jesus Christ. It's not all up to you. Even though it is our mission, if we fail at our mission, God will use the rocks if he has to. God will not fail to show the world that Christ, their Savior, has come. So that is our mission, should we choose to accept it. To point out to the world that God's kingdom is breaking in, that God's reign is upon us in Jesus Christ. That the king has come, the savior reigns. And today, we are challenged to go out as missionaries, as those who are sent to point out where God is at work. So what does this look like? Well, there are four areas that Michael Frost talks about when it comes to living out being missionaries or being sent with this mission. And the first area is the area of reconciliation. Bringing people back to God and bringing people who are are separated from one another back together. The ministry of of reconciliation is a way in which we can can help point out God's reign and join in being a part of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible describes it this way. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself and Christ, not counting people's sins against them, And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ Jesus. And our message, our mission, is to announce it, to champion it, to advocate for it, and to demonstrate it. We are sent as Christ's ambassadors of reconciliation. And whenever we see it, we can name it so others can know that God is at work. You might have heard me tell a story about one of the most difficult people that I ever dealt with as a district superintendent. This man would call me several times a week to yell at me, scream at me, tell me I was doing a terrible job and that I was an awful person. He would threaten me both on the phone and in person. And he would call me a liar in in church meetings and he would spread lies about me when I was gone. He was not one of my favorite people. And this went on for a long time. And one winter he went south. And I have to tell you that I was not disappointed that that the call stopped. And then I heard that, uh, that he'd gotten very sick down south and that he was not able to come back as, as soon as uh, he had hoped to Minnesota. And I have to tell you that I was not disappointed. I have to confess that, that my heart was not quite right there. And I enjoyed that, that time when he was away but then there came a time when he did come back and the phone rang 
and I could see it was his number. And I almost didn't answer it. But the Spirit nudged me, and I did. And he said, Mark, you know I've been down south, and I was very sick. I was hospitalized. I nearly died. And I'm calling you today because I just want to apologize for the way that I treated you. That was an act of God. God reconciling us. God working in both of us. And, and we began to, to rebuild the relationship. And by the time he died several years later, my heart grieved at his passing. God is reconciling the world to himself and Jesus Christ and reconciling us to one another. And when we see it, it's our mission to point it out. It's our mission to let the world know that Christ reigns and reconciliation is happening. Now, another area where God reigns is in the area of justice. God reigns whenever we see justice breaking into an unjust world. My son, Corey, and his wife, Kayla, have had a a verse that has been very important to them Uh, really for for many years. And they have put it up in plaques and they have uh, even made artwork about it. It's Micah 6, 8, which says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Justice is a sign of God's kingdom breaking in. John Wesley and the early Methodists visited those who were in prison and they helped the poor and they advocated for for the slaves to be freed. They were all about justice. And even today, when someone cares about those prisoners who are terrified because they can't separate with the, the COVID virus coming around, when people are standing up for those with addictions and disabilities and from different nationalities and whatever... When, when anyone is saved from poverty or from this pandemic, you can celebrate it and you can say, this is the work of God. God's reign is breaking in through Jesus Christ. And that is part of our mission, to share that. A third thing that we can do is to look for beauty. Beauty is another way that God's reign breaks into this world. It's a reminder of of the original creation that God said was so good. In Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses the lilies of the valley, or the flowers of the field, as this translation calls it, as an example of God's love, God's care. See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? All beauty points to our Creator. All beauty points to God's reign. My son, Luke, and I, we like to send pictures back and forth of whenever we catch beauty. It's usually something out in nature. He sent me a picture this week. Uh, He's out uh, sheltering in place in in North Dakota in Bismarck. And they had half a foot of snow, and it looked just like a shot from January. And yet it was gorgeous to see the prairies covered with snow. He sent the picture. We say, ah, so beautiful. Thank God. We send back and forth sunsets or or he sent some pictures of wildlife that he's seen. And whenever we see that, that beauty of God's creation, it reminds us that we live in a world where God reigns. Many of you know that the Boundary Waters is one of my favorite places. I just love to go there to be out on the water or to sit on on shore as the mist is rising in the morning, the sun is coming up, or to sit out on a rock 
as darkness falls. And the Milky Way is so brilliant in the northern Minnesota sky. And, and I love those times. But I love even more the opportunity to share that with others and to point out God's beauty. My youngest son, Lee, is a pastor. And he says that, that the beauty of the Boundary Waters had as much to do with his giving his life to God in service as anything that ever happened in church. It was there in the beauty of God's creation that he discovered God's reign. And it's not just the natural things. Any beauty that you see, you can point to and thank God. Whether it be a painting, whether it be a sculpture, whether it be a gorgeous garden with flowers coming up, whether it be a song, Anytime our lives are touched by beauty, we can point that out to others and say, God reigns. This is a gift. This is a gift. And pointing that out to people is part of our mission. Finally, uh, the fourth area is wholeness or healing. Healing in, in its fullest sense. Whenever people are caring for others, whenever healing and wholeness is being brought about, it is God's reign made visible. There's a story in the book of Acts in chapters 3 and 4, how Peter and John use the healing of a man as a way of pointing out God's reign in Jesus Christ. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. And at three in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And then Peter and, and John, they don't just continue on, but they use that opportunity to point out how God has broken into the world and how Jesus Christ is at work. And of course, this upsets, upsets the authorities and they wind up being arrested. So I'm going to skip ahead to the next day in chapter 4, verse 5. The next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? On whose authority were you going about healing somebody? But then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus said, The stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And this is Psalm 118 again. Jesus is quoting Psalm 118. And then he continues, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see that the man who had been healed was standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. 
Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they've performed a notable sign, and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. It's amazing what they're worried about spreading in those days. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. As for us, we can't help speaking about what we have seen and heard. It goes for Peter and John. It also goes for us. As Christians, it's our mission. We can't help speaking about what we've seen and heard. And so we speak and we praise God and we give thanks for all those who are working for healing, for those who are, are doctors and nurses and caregivers and, and anyone working in the health profession, and especially at this time. Whenever we see people who are giving their lives to healing and wholeness, we can point it out and say, God is at work. Thanks be to God. And even if we can't be a healthcare professional, all of us can do something. The social distancing, the staying at home, all of those things are ways in which we can contribute to the health of our neighbors and those around us. How we can be involved with God in the work of healing and in this part of God's reign. It too is a part of our mission. So whenever we see healing and wholeness taking part, taking place, we can point it out. It's our mission. And so that is your mission, should you choose to accept it. And know that uh, this message is not going to self-destruct in five seconds. This message will continue on until Christ's return. It is always our mission. It is always our mission to help others see that God is at work. So when you see reconciliation happen, point it out. God is at work. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And when you see justice breaking in, point it out. God is at work. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. When beauty is discovered, point it out. God is at work. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And when wholeness and healing happen, point it out. God is at work. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Christ reigns. And your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to help others see it. Hosanna. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, this week is Holy Week. We're not going to be able to celebrate it the way we have in the past. We won't be able to be together in our usual ways. But thank you, God, for the opportunities that we have through technology, the opportunities that we have one-on-one -on -one to a card, a phone call, text message. Lord, in whatever way we can, help us to fulfill our mission this week, to let others know that you reign. And then when we gather on Easter, Lord, although we may not be gathering physically, we will gather together across the globe and we'll proclaim that you are risen and that your reign continues forever and ever.